So in this talk, we're going to cover a lot of ground before we get to the actual point of the whole thing, which is on one slide. I used to work at Progress, but I'm no longer there. I retired from Progress in 2016. And there's some useless facts about me. When I first started, I was the only database developer. First I fixed bugs, then I became the database development team. <laughs> uh, back then the company was pretty small. The whole development organization was 23 people. And Mike Fergal, who's sitting back there, was one of the people in development, which is, but he was part of IT, which was part of development back then. Here is me arriving at a conference in uh, Caesar's Palace in Dallas, or in uh, Las Vegas. Feel free to interrupt me if you have a question. I'll do my best to notice if you raise your hand or you say something. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I have a lot of details to go over, I left out some things because otherwise we'd have to be here all day. So here's a, the topics that we're going to cover. And also the first quiz. So why do you need to know all this stuff? So that when we get to the very end, you'll see why it has to be that way. Okay, so first, since we're going to talk about records and record formats and how they're stored and how the uh, before image log uh, is affected by what goes on with records, we start at a high level. So where do we put records? Well, we put them in storage areas. And storage areas are made up of extents. Everybody knows that. And an extent is divided up into blocks. And there's a bunch of different block types internally for different kinds of data. Here's a generic block. It has a header that's the same in every block. The first 16 bytes in a type 1 uh, storage area is where the header is. Uh, and then there's data after that that depends on what type of block it is. So an index block has index information in it, and a record block has records. So in a record block, there's another header that's a record block header that comes after the generic block header. And uh, part of what's in there is information so that we can find all the records. The records are, are stored in uh, the bottom of the record, uh, uh, the bottom of the block, then there's free space, and above that is a list of uh, directory entries. There's a, a directory that has the location within the block for each of the records. So they can move around as needed. So for example here, if we were to delete uh, record two, then record one would slide down and occupy the space that record two was at. So then the uh, directory entry up at the top would get adjusted. So that way we can keep all the free space in one big chunk. So here's a slightly different view of it to show how the directories work. Now, when you uh, set up the database and you set up how many records per block you want to have uh, in a storage area, then 
Uh, that determines also what the maximum size of the directory is. The directory starts out uh, with no entries at all in a brand new record block. And then as you put records into that block, directory entries get added till you get to the maximum or you run out of space, one of the two. And then if you delete records, the directory entries can be deleted as well. So these uh, structures can vary in size as the database is used and, and things happen. The row ID remains the same, and uh, you'll see why shortly, but the, 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 the row ID can be unaffected because the, the uh, um, so the, let's say, for example, you had uh, 32 records per block. So that means that a row ID for a type one area would have uh, five bits of record number within a block, because that's how much it takes to get to 32. So the, the lowest five bits would be uh, the record number. And the record number part of the row ID refers to which directory entry do we need to use. So the record can move as long as the directory entry doesn't move. So if you want record number three, you look in the third directory entry, and then from there you can find the record, no matter where it gets moved to. Then, because records can be bigger than blocks, you might have uh, several pieces stored in different blocks. Uh, that get chained together when we read the record out. That turns out to be entirely irrelevant to the rest of this discussion. <laughs> okay, so let's look at a short example. So we make a copy of the Sports 2000 database and in that database the customer table is in area nine. And area nine is uh, sports2000-9.d1 is the first extent. So we go look for customer number 10 there. Find customer 10 display rec ID. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, Let's just assume that rec IDs and row IDs are identical. They mean exactly the same thing. The differences are not important. Um, so we find out that the, the rec ID is um, 106. So if you take that and uh, divide by the maximum number of records per block. So we divide by 32, we get three with a remainder of 10. So that record is in the third block, the 10th record. That's how you find it. So you go look in the 10th directory entry and you get a number from there that says it's uh, 758 bytes from the beginning of the block. Here is that block that half of it dumped out. So you can see up at the very top, the first two lines is the block header. And then after that comes the uh, record block header. The, the uh, And then uh, and there's a whole bunch of zeros, that's free space. So in between the uh, free space and the header is the directory entries, which in, in this case 
there's a bunch of free ones, but there's not much space left in the block either. But this is a small table in the sports database, so um, uh, the rec there's more records than, than will fit in this block, but there's not that many in total. Um, so you don't have to decode this, but however, you can see over on the right-hand side, there's a text representation of the data, so you can see the uh, customer name in there and some other stuff, like the uh, addresses which if you're actually looking for one of these things because you have a reason to, then the text is helpful to make sure you're in the right place. Okay, so now let's take a look at the structure of a record. What does it look like? Well, there's a bunch of pieces. First of all, if the record is fragmented, so there's more in some other block. Then there's a next fragment row ID uh, that tells us where to go get it. Uh, that's optional, because if, if the record is all in a single block, then we don't need that. Um, then there's something called a field map. There may be more than one of these, because we do this schema versioning that we did in uh, version 9, so that when you make database changes, we can uh, leave the records alone until you have some reason to go read them. And the versioning information tells us how to upgrade the record to whatever the current version is. So there may be several information about different versions in different records in the database, depending on what kind of activity there's been in the past. After that, there's this thing called the skip list, which I'll explain in a minute. And then there's all the different fields. The first field is invisible to the 4GL, and it contains the table number. So, for example, when you're doing uh, index rebuilds or other maintenance operations, uh, in the type 1 area, we can find all of the records that belong to the table whose index you're rebuilding by matching up with the table number. And then there's the rest of the fields after that. All of these items that are in there are variable length. So, uh, we need a way to easily and fairly efficiently find a particular field. So when the 4GL wants to do something with the uh, customer zip code, we have to know where to go get it. And the skip table uh, helps us to do that because the skip table contains the uh, byte offset from the beginning of the record to every 16th field. And then, so you go to the 16th field that's closest to the one you want, and then from there, you look at the field lengths to get to the one that you want. So if the first field is 10 bytes long, then you know the next one starts 10 bytes after that, and so on. So this is how field maps work. There's a logical or virtual record layout, and then there's the physical record layout that's actually on disk. So in this example, we've deleted one of the fields in a schema change operation. So it's still out there in the record, but the uh, virtual record layout that the 4GL sees does not have that field. So, and the table CRC is on the virtual record layout, not the physical. So what all that enables us to do 
is we can make a lot of schema changes fairly quickly. So if you go to delete or field, we don't have to go through all the records and touch every one. We just make a new uh, schema version and uh, the field map tells us what was there before the schema change and then the schema tables tell us what the current version is. So the field map lets us translate from one to the other as needed. So the skip table starts with a one byte skip table marker. So if that particular marker is present in the record, then we know there's a skip table there. Um, and then after that, there's a two byte length for the skip table. How many entries are, are there? And then there's two byte entries after that for the offsets to every 16th field. If you have less than 16 fields in the table, then we don't need a skip table. So it's not there. So among other things, that means that if you look at this uh, layout here, there's a certain amount of overhead in addition to the actual data that you put there. Yes. The um, fields are variable length. All. That means there are separators between the values? No, there's no separators. I'll explain how that works in a second. Okay. But all the different data types, they're all variable length. So here's what, how that works. There's a length byte is the first thing in the field and that is either one byte or three bytes. And then comes the data. So for example, if it's a character field that has five characters in it, then the length byte will say five. So it'll be one byte. If it's a longer character field, let's say it's a thousand bytes, then the length one byte isn't enough to say a thousand, so there's a, a lead byte that says there's a two byte length field, not a one byte length field. So that takes three bytes. So there's various special values for the length field. The data part is optional, but there's always a length byte, which some of the length byte values have special meanings like there's a, uh, if the length byte is 253, that means the value is the unknown value. And there's no data value part in that case. If the length is zero, that means it's an integer whose value is zero. And we don't need any more information. And so there's the other things. There's the skip table marker and so on. Um, there can be missing values. Um, for example, if you use the fields uh, option in the 4GL, then the real values get replaced with missing value markers when the server retrieves the record so it doesn't send it to the client. So that shortens the amount of data that gets transmitted. Uh, then there's the deleted field placeholder, which doesn't, that isn't really needed anymore, but we used to use that and whenever schema changes got made um, and you deleted a, a, a field in the schema, the records got uh, deleted field placeholders put in them. That mechanism, we don't really need that anymore. Yes? Do you uh, use two or nine fields? Two 
for I saw a special value when it was 249 and maybe I was a little bit sloppy, oh. but the yes. value is today's date. It's very okay. strange one. So in, when you uh, create a record, it's, it, it can be initialized to today, whatever that is. In that case, the record has this uh, marker in it that says, Take this out and put the real today's date in there. So, uh, so that way those, those values can get automatically generated when you're creating records. Yeah. Just to clarify that, that's from the template record. Just to clarify that, the, that marker is in the template record. So when it gets that's, copied that's, from the template, it gets converted to the today's That's correct, date. yeah. So, so, Every uh, table in the database has a template record. And so when you create a record, we make a copy of the template to start with. And then you go through and uh, initialize certain uh, values like the today field uh, with current information. And the rest of the record has whatever initial values you define for it. Okay, so how do we know where field five's data begins? You start at the beginning, you look at the first length field, you move ahead that many bytes, look at the length field there, move ahead that many bytes till you get to field five. Now, if you had 100 fields, that might take you a little longer which is why we have the skip table. Machines uh, are much faster than they were when that mechanism got designed, but it's still there and it's still useful. Okay, now we're gonna go uh, in the weeds. No. <laughs> So I have presented this information before, uh, but the last time I did was quite a while ago, and that data is kind of obsolete now uh, because the hardware has changed. So I have an update, um, which, you know, I'm not going to talk about these things. It's just useful information to know about how long things take. There's two slides there with that in it. Um, and eventually, you'll be able to download the slide decks from, uh, from the PUG website. So that's just so you can have that. All right, now, let's take a look at the transaction logs and how, uh, how BI notes uh, are stored and how they work. So we have two types of transaction logs. We have the before image log and we have the after image log, which is optional. Um, so the before image log is used for two things. If you undo a transaction, it gets rolled back. So we go through all the changes you made and put everything back the way it was before. The other thing it's used for is crash recovery. So if the database gets shut down without, without it being done through a shutdown, it just stops for some reason, um, there may be data and memory that's lost because it didn't get a chance to write it out. So crash recovery has to do repairs in that case. Or if you have a power failure, for example, um, you might lose some information in memory and uh, so the before image log uh, has enough information in it so crash recovery can fix it. Um, and 
the after image log gets used uh, for um, a couple of different things. One is data replication. So we take the after image data and send it somewhere else where we uh, do a roll forward operation on it and so that we're doing all the same operations that were originally done in some other database to produce the same result there. Uh, so that, that can happen either through the progress replication or you can take the files and send them somewhere and do row forward operations on them uh, with scripts or some manual mechanism as well. But we've told you lies. Because there are no before images and there's no after images. These transaction logs, both types, have information in them that allows us to undo a transaction or redo a transaction. But it's not before images or after images. It's depending on the operation, you need different kinds of information to do those things. So for example, if you're creating an index entry, there's no before image because it didn't exist before. And to undo, you, you just take out the index entry that you created. So it depends on, on the particular database operation what information you need. So there's a, over a hundred different uh, note types in uh, the before image log. The before image log is made up of clusters, a sequence of uh, before image blocks that together make up a cluster. And so when we write uh, notes into the before image log, we start at one end of the cluster and we just write sequentially through the cluster up until we get to the end. Uh, so all those blocks get filled up with, with before image notes. Then when you get to the end of the cluster, you go to the next cluster and you continue writing there. Pretty simple mechanism. So what's in a BI note or log record? Well, here's a list of stuff that's in there. So there's a note header that has the transaction number, which data area it applies to, and then which block. So for every operation that we do to a block in the database, you get at least one note uh, that says what you did. So, for example, if you create a record and it's fragmented, so you end up with three pieces, then there will be some kind of note for each piece. That, and so the, the three blocks that get updated each get their change recorded separately in the before image log. Same thing with index operations. If you have a block splitter or something, you get multiple notes for the operation that you're doing. Um, so the stuff that goes in the before image file and the stuff that goes in the after image file, it's the same thing. There's minor differences that exist between those two things. That's because I'm stupid. Because those, the differences that exist are unnecessary. We could have made them 100% identical and everything would work the same, but it would work more efficiently. Okay, so now we've got these BI notes happening. Let's take a look at how they work.
So here's some data block. And one of the things that's in the header is this block version number. In the code, we call it the update counter, but it's really a version number. So every time you change the block, the version number gets incremented. So you start out with uh, version 0, then version 1, then version 2, then version 3, and so on. This has nothing to do with our topic, but it is very cool. This is a Dutch bricklaying machine. Ah, I'm amazed. Yeah. All right. So how do we use before image notes? So let's say we have version one of block two. We also have this thing called a do machine that's in the code in the database. And for each uh, note type, there's some piece of code that knows how to do that operation. So we have uh, a whole bunch of these things that are part of the database code. And then when we make a change to a record, the first thing we do is we figure out what we need to put in the log record. And that gets recorded in the before image file. So we use the information that's in that log record and feed it to the do machine. And that allows us to uh, go from version one of that block to version two, making whatever change the uh, BI note says to do. So I might say, for example, create a record. So, uh, so the do machine then would go create a record in that block. So we get a new version of the block when that happens. In this example, we're making an update. So we're changing the string Gus in our character field to Carol let's say. So, um, so that's how changes get propagated into the database. And that's also how the after image processes the notes. So when you're doing a roll forward, the same operation happens. If you do a crash recovery and you lost all the changes that were in memory, this mechanism can reproduce all the changes that were lost. Now, how do we undo? Well, we have a thing called the undo machine, which knows for each operation, what do you do to put things back the way they were? So for, for that, we have the log record, we have the new version of the block that got updated, but now since we're gonna undo that operation because we're rolling back the transaction, so we're gonna undo the change that we just made. So we take those two things, feed them into the undo machine, and the undo machine gives us the next version of that block, because we're changing it again. And it also gives us a new log record that says what we did to it. So that's how things work in general. The details are different for each operation type. But since our topic here is records, and what do, what do we do with uh, records, we'll look at that next.
So if you're creating a record, we get a BI note that has a copy of the record we created. And the reason it's a copy of the record we created is because if you crash and we have to re redo that operation, we need the new record. To undo, we don't need the new record, but we need to take out the new record from the block and throw it away. For delete, uh, we have in the note a copy of the whole record. And then we also, when you delete a record, we put a placeholder where the record used to be. And the placeholder is there so that we can lock that row ID temporarily because if some other user came along and said, oh, here's an unused row ID I can take, if they put something there, then you can't undo the delete later because somebody else took that spot, so you can't put your record back. So we lock the row ID for, for that, and the way we do that is we put the transaction number there. And so the lock is valid as long as the transaction is still active. Once the transaction commits, then we can take the lock out. We don't actually take the lock out. What happens then is we eventually notice that there's a placeholder and we take it out then while we're doing something else to that block. So if we later are gonna create another record in that same block, we also look to see are the placeholders still valid? And if, they are, if they're not, then we take them out. So if you're updating a record, then we create this thing called a difference note. And the difference note contains a bitewise copy of the data that got changed and some extra stuff. The way that works is, let's say for this example, we change a character field from Mike to Paul. So when we're generating the difference note, we start at the beginning of the record and we compare until we find a spot where it's different. So we find the beginning of the uh, different section of the record, and then we start at the other end and we do the same comparison. So we, we figure out, okay, those four characters got changed. So that's what we put in the difference record, the original value and the new value. So we need the original value in case we have to undo and we need a new value in case we have to do crash recovery or if we're going to do roll forward. So the idea there is to, you don't need the whole record because the parts that didn't change, uh, why do you need copies of those? because you have it in the data block. Um, and uh, I implemented this mechanism a long, long time ago, but I didn't do it right. And you'll see why in a minute. So what happens when you have an update where the new value is bigger than the old value? Well, a couple of things. One is that the difference note has two different parts to it. One part's bigger than the other. But also, when you uh, make that change in the record, let's say it's 
in the middle of a pile of records in the database block. So there's a block comes after it and another one before it. But now the record is bigger, so you gotta move stuff out of the way so that you have room for one more character. Which means you gotta readjust the directory entries above to take that into account. Which is another reason why uh, we have the directory entry, so we can move things around without making uh, things invalid. Okay, so what happens if you change more than one field in an update? Well, so when we do the scan to figure out what to put in the uh, update in the difference note, we do the scan and we, we find the first part that's different and we find the last part that's different, but there's this section in between that's the same. Well, I told you I did it wrong. <laughs> so, um, so we end up with some extra information in the difference note that doesn't really need to be there. Um, but anyway, that mechanism is there and it works fine most of the time. So we end up with a difference note that has that in it. And then the same question, what happens when the new value is bigger than the old value? Well, here's where I was really stupid. So the new value is bigger, so the record is longer. And uh, so when we do the scan to figure out what to put in the difference note, this doesn't work. Because what really happens is since the uh, new value is bigger, we have gotta move everything down to make room which means all the fields move. And that means the skip table has to get changed. So when you start figuring out where the first change is in the record, it's at the very beginning where the skip table is. So you end up now with a difference note that's got this in it instead of a smaller amount of stuff. So it didn't have to be that way, but it is. There's a lot of quotes about experience. Good experience, or good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. Okay, so what happens now because of this? Well, so we now have these difference notes, which get generated for record updates, that are bigger, in some cases, a lot bigger. So that causes some amount of performance loss doing these operations, because they take a little longer but also we're using up more BI and AI space. We're using disk space. And uh, that could end up being uh, significant. Also, we have more stuff to send across the wire when you're doing replication. So there's a bunch of bad side effects. They're not terrible but they're not good either. So, what can we conclude from all of this? What's the whole point here? In this case, we're talking about my code. But, 
There's also some things you can do to mitigate the effects of all this. So when you're setting up tables and defining the fields that go in them, there's some things you can do that will help to keep the differences smaller than they would be if you just did things the way I showed in the example. So if you first put all the indexed fields, because generally they don't change, but that's not always true, and it's not true for every indexed field either, but at least some of them, once you define them, they stay the same. For example, the customer number never changes. So it's relatively static. Then there's a bunch of other stuff like the customer address and name and different things that may not be indexed, but they don't change either. And then there's stuff that does change, and if you try to put as much of that as you can toward the end of the record, that minimizes the effect on the skip table. And if I'd have been thinking well enough, we would have put the skip table into the note by itself, separate from the difference part. Anyway, so, so those are a couple of things you can do. But then also, when you're creating records, uh, this is where the coding part comes in, you got to do things uh, the right way. And one of the ways that you should do things is use the assign statement and assign as much stuff as you can in a single assign statement. The reason for that is because the 4GL runtime delays create, create operations as long as possible. So when you say create in the 4GL, it doesn't actually do the entire create operation. It just makes a copy of the template, but it doesn't tell the database about it. So it's sitting in memory in the 4GL so that you can go assign all the field values that you're going to assign. But there's also this index validation that happens. So if you assign the first index field but not the others, that can cause the record to be sent to the database and created in the database and an index entry generated. So we can tell, OK, is there a duplicate if it's a unique index? So if you put all the new index values in together in the same assign statement, that's only going to happen one time rather than several times. And if it happens multiple times, what happens is the first time the record gets created, so you get BI notes that say create a record, and then later the rest of the changes are going to be updates. So you turn a create into a create and one or more updates. I've seen a lot of code that does that, and it's not efficient. So it has a performance impact, as well as a, how much log data are you generating. Also, if you do things like you ask for the rec ID or the row ID, well, the row ID is an encoding of the storage location in the database. Which block is the record in? Well, it doesn't have a block until it actually gets created. So when you say, I want the rec ID, that means we've got to send the record to the database, do the create operation in the database, and send the rec ID back to you. So if you don't need the rec ID, don't ask for it. Once you've created the record and it's all there, then you can get the row ID without any other bad things happening. OK, so that's the takeaways from all this, how records are organized and how BI notes work. Now, I have a homework assignment for you. <laughs> 
which is go home and try this and look at what happens. So you create a database, put a table into it with almost uh, 32 fields maybe, or more, enough so that you get a skip table with more than one entry. Um, make a bunch of data, so create a couple hundred rows, and then turn on after imaging. There are some extra slides at the end that tell you how to do it in case you forgot. Um, and then go do some updates that cause the skip table to change. And do some updates also separately where the skip table doesn't change and compare those two things. So the way to do that is first you make the change that doesn't affect the skip table. You get AI generated for that. So when you finish that, then go switch AI file. So do after image new to go to the next AI file. And then do the second part where you uh, cause the skip table to change. And compare those two things. The way to compare them is that the uh, roll forward stuff has a feature in it called AI image scan. So you can give it an after image file and it'll produce a report of what's in there. I'll show you what that looks like. And then we'll come back. All right, so here's how to do the AI stuff. So to get your report of what's in the after image file, here's the commands you need to do that. Uh, you can't do it online. And here's how you switch to the next AI file. In the report, you get stuff that looks like this. So in this case, we're doing a transaction that creates a record. So there's a bunch of notes there. Um, so the first thing is uh, a note that starts the transaction, then there's a note for creating the record, and then there's uh, three notes to put in index entries. And then the transaction ends. So for the homework assignment, what exactly these reports say to do isn't really important. What actually is important is how big did the after image files get? Since that was the whole point of uh, what's going to happen, what are the bad effects uh, of the way the uh, update records, difference re records work. Um, so you can look at the, the reports which will be longer in one case than in the other, but uh, um, I mainly put that in just so you could go look, if you're curious. Here's another example, so a different transaction where we're updating a record. So that's the end. Let me go back to the Slide before the bonus slides. Questions? We got a few minutes left. Yes. Hold on, hold on. Okay, so before you ask, the reason he's giving you a microphone is so the online people can hear the question. Um, if you change the schema of a table and delete a field, at what point does it actually get deleted? Ah, good question. So when does the deleted field actually get deleted? The answer is, if you make the schema change, then we generate a new version and a new field map out of 
the information that's in the schema. So, uh, but we don't have to touch the record. So the record is not what's current anymore. When you go read that record from the database, so the 4GL goes and retrieves it, that's when we make the translation to the current version. So at that point, we'll take the deleted field out. But if you're not updating, we don't write that back to the database, then we just throw it away when it's not needed anymore. Other questions? Yeah. Does this mean that uh, all schema versions in the database, different schema versions? Yes. Right. If you, there can be many different schema versions for different tables or even for a single table. If you never touch a record, it's just there, but you never read it, but nobody ever looks at it, it can have version 2 in, in what's on the disk in the database and version 10 for what's current. And if you do go read it, it'll go through and make it current so that you'll see the correct view of it. But um, it only gets written back to the database if it would be updated anyway. If you don't update it, we don't do it right. Mike? So I'm going to state the obvious just to make sure it is obvious. You delete uh, field two and you've got 20 fields in the database. It doesn't yeah. get deleted at the time. And then you add field 21. And then you go populate field 21. Your BI difference note will now be starting at field two and ending at field 21. Correct? No, not correct. Then clarify, please. It'll start at the skip table. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the point of that is when you're adding new fields to, and doing schema changes, if you put in new fields, put them at the end. And if you delete a field, delete the last field. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it, do, it doesn't matter because we don't actually do the delete. Uh, Okay, we got a couple minutes left. Any other questions? Yeah. If you could change something. <laughs> what would you change? Ah, if I could change something, what would I change? Well, your question is making an assumption. Which is that I, today I'm smarter than I was then. <laughs> well, so I would, I would make several changes. One is I'd make the uh, skip table changes separate from the field changes so that we don't have this other problem. But in addition, I would do field by field comparisons and not put in the fields that didn't change, even if there were two fields with stuff in between that didn't change. I would just put the two that did change. <laughs> I'm retired. I'm not allowed to make changes. And neither is Mike. Anybody else? All right, thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>